In this lecture, we're going to start talking about some geometric interpretations of vectors and linear algebra ideas. Eventually, this will tie back into the diagonalization and diagonalizability arguments that we were talking about earlier, but for a while, this will seem like some different stuff. So recall that in Rn, and specifically in R2 and R3, we often think of vectors as arrows, with a starting point and an ending point. And typically, we think of an arrow as being in its standard position when the arrow starts at the origin and then points out to some point in space. And so when we think about vectors in this way, we can apply some geometric concepts such as length, distance, and perpendicularity to these vectors. Specifically, when we think of vectors in Rn, we can think of these as one-column matrices. And so that allows us to compute what we call the inner product of these two vectors, which is simply the transpose of the first vector multiplied by the second vector, using the regular matrix multiplication definition. Since we only have one row in the first matrix and one column in the second matrix, all we're really doing is multiplying each entry of the vector u by the corresponding entry in the vector v and adding up the results. So we get as u1 v1 plus u2 v2 and so on plus un vn. Now, technically, that would be in a little one-by-one one matrix, but we think of this one-by-one one matrix as simply being a scalar. So the dot product or inner product of two vectors is a scalar that we get by multiplying the corresponding entries and adding the results. Now, inner product has some nice algebraic properties. For example, it's commutative. u dot v is the same as v dot u. There's a distributive property u plus v dot w is equal to u dot w plus v dot w. Notice, by the way, that as I talk about this, I'm using the word dot rather than the word times. We really want to be careful with how we discuss this. Um, if you've studied some physics or some other courses, you might be familiar with the cross product of two vectors. That's not something we're really going to talk too much about, but there are different kinds of products for vectors. And so we want to be really careful not to use the word times here, unless what we mean is really honest to goodness, scalar multiplication. Speaking of scalar multiplication, c times u dot v is the same as c times u dot v, and that's the same as u dot c times v. So if I ever use the word times, I'm meaning scalar multiplication. If I use the word dot, then obviously I mean the dot product or the inner product that we just talked about. Another important property is that u dot u is always greater than or equal to zero. And this is because if we dot a vector with itself, what we're getting is u1 times u1 plus u2 times u2 plus u3 times u3 and so on. And so this is simply the sum of the squares of the entries in our vector. And since when you square a number, you get something non-negative and add those together, the dot product of a vector with itself is always non-negative. And in fact, the only way that we could get this to equal zero would be if each of these products is itself zero. In other words, if u is the zero vector. Speaking of dotting a vector with itself, our definition here is that the length of a vector, sometimes also called the norm of a vector, is simply the square root of the vector dotted with itself, the square root of the sum of those squares. And if this seems a little strange, then just remember that in R2, this is the Pythagorean theorem. Because if I have a vector that points from the origin to some point, v1 comma v2, then the distance from the origin to that vector is simply the sum, the square root of the sum of the squares of these distances. That distance is v1, that distance is v2, so by the Pythagorean theorem, this is v1 squared plus v2 squared. A nice property of the norm is that if we multiply a vector by a scalar, that scales the norm, that scales the length of that vector. So if we double a vector, that doubles its length. If we multiply a vector by one half, which is the same as dividing it by two, that cuts its length in half. Now we have to be a little bit careful because we are allowed to multiply vectors by negative scalars, but length is not allowed to be negative. And so if we were to, for example, multiply a vector by, say, negative three, that would triple the length of the vector. It wouldn't multiply the length by negative three. So that's why you see these absolute values here and here. So if the scalar happens to be negative, the effect on the length is still a positive effect. Now when a vector happens to have length one, we think that's fairly special, and so we give that a name, we call that a unit vector. Now we've already seen several examples of unit vectors, and the most common of those is the standard basis vectors e1, e2, and so on. If you recall, e1 is the vector that has a 1 in its first position and zeros everywhere else. e2 has a 0 and then a 1 in the second position and then zeros everywhere else. 
and so on. So there's my vector e1, there's my vector e2. And if I were to take the sum of the squares of the entries of those vectors, I would just get 1, and the square root of 1 is 1. So those are all examples of unit vectors. Now, if we're given any vector, we can create a unit vector simply by dividing that vector by its own length. So the resulting length of that vector would be 1, regardless of what the length of the original vector was. Now, we can also think of distance between two points as really being the distance between two vectors. So again, I'll draw a picture in R2, but the idea translates up into any number of dimensions. So if I have two vectors here, so let's call this the vector u, which points to the point u1, u2, and a vector over here, which I'll call v, which points to the point v1, comma v2. Then the distance between these two points, I can think of as the distance between the two vectors. And the vector u minus v points from the head of v to the head of u. So this vector right here would be u minus v. And so the distance between those two points is simply the length of that vector. The length of u minus v is the distance between u and v. Now in R2, two vectors are perpendicular if and only if the distance between u and v is the same as the distance between u and negative v. Let's draw a picture to try to understand why that is. So here we are in R2. Here's a vector u. And let's say this is our vector v, where I've tried to draw it so that they're obviously not perpendicular. Well, negative v would point in the opposite direction of v, but still have the same length. And so hopefully you can see here is that this distance from u to v is not the same as this distance from v to u. But if I try to draw the vectors so that they are perpendicular, maybe we'll say u is over here now, and here's our v, and if negative v is the same length as v but pointing in the opposite direction, then now we can see, hopefully, that the distance from u to v is the same as the distance from u to negative v. So that's a geometric principle that we can see in two dimensions, but we can expand this and extend this to any number of dimensions. So that will be our definition. Our definition is that two vectors u and v are orthogonal, so we use the word orthogonal here because in multiple dimensions, angles are a little bit hard, harder to understand when we're, say, talking about seven-dimensional space. What does an angle really mean? So we don't really want to use the word perpendicular, and so in linear algebra, you'll typically see the word orthogonal. But think of orthogonal and perpendicular as essentially representing the same idea. But the definition is that these two vectors are orthogonal if the distance from u to v, that's norm of u minus v, is the same as the distance from u to minus v. That's the norm of u minus minus v, which is the same as u plus v. But now we can simplify that by realizing that when we square the two norms, that's really just taking the dot product of u minus v with u minus v, or the dot product of u plus v with u plus v. Using those nice algebraic properties that we have, what we get are two similar expressions for the norm of u minus v squared and the norm of u plus v squared. And if we set those two things equal to each other, so if we set these two expressions equal, the u dot u will cancel from both sides, the v dot v will cancel from both sides, and then we can add 2 u times u dot v to both sides. That gives us 4 times u dot v equals 0, which is the same as saying that u dot v equals 0. So our criteria, our much simpler criteria for determining whether two vectors are orthogonal, is to simply take the dot product of those two vectors and see if we get the number 0. If we do, then the vectors are orthogonal, and if we don't, then they're not. Now one thing that we can do with orthogonality is think of what we call the orthogonal complement of a subspace. So if w is a subspace of Rn and z is just some vector in Rn, we say that z is orthogonal to the space w, right? We just talked about what it means for one vector to be orthogonal to another vector. Now we're talking about what it means for a vector to be orthogonal to a subspace. And that just means that z is orthogonal to every vector in the subspace. And then the orthogonal complement of w which we write w with a little perpendicular sign. And so we read this as w perp, is how we say that, w perp. That's the set of all the vectors that happen to be orthogonal to w. Now this might seem a little crazy because you say, well, I'd have to have a vector that was perpendicular to everything in the subspace w. But we can think of an example by imagining that w is some plane through the origin, 
And then if we think of the a line through the origin, here's our origin here, the line that's perpendicular to w, then all of the vectors in that line will be perpendicular to all of the vectors in w. And so that line would in fact be w perp, the orthogonal complement of w. And now to connect this back to some of the ideas that we talked about earlier in the course, for any matrix A, any m by n matrix A, it turns out that the column space of A, if we take the orthogonal complement, what we get is the null space of the transpose of the matrix. And now we didn't really talk about the row space of A, but you can imagine what that is. The column space is the span of all the columns of A, the row space is the span of all the rows of A. And the orthogonal complement of the row space of A is in fact the null space of A. Let's see why that works. So let's, let's say we had a matrix like this. Let's give it a name. Let's call it capital A, and let's give names to the rows of A. So in this case, the rows are u1, u2, all the way through um, and since they're row vectors, what the, we can really think of those as just being the transposes of a bunch of vectors. Remember, normally vectors we think of as being columns, and so to write these vectors as rows, we need to transpose. So u1 transpose, that's the first row of A u2 transpose, that's the second row of A, and so on. And now remember that to multiply a matrix by a vector, we go across the rows, and then we go down the column. And so essentially all we're doing is taking a dot product. The row u1 dot the vector x, the row u2 dot the vector x, and so on. And for ax to equal 0, that means that every single one of these dot products would have to work out to be 0. For this resulting product to be the 0 vector, all of those individual dot products would have to be 0. And that would happen exactly when x was orthogonal to all of the vectors u1, u2, all the way through un. And that shows us that the null space, the vectors x that solve that equation, are exactly those vectors that are orthogonal to everything in the row space. So that's a neat little connection with orthogonality to row spaces, column spaces, and null spaces, which is something we talked a lot about a little earlier in the course. So we established a lot of terminology, there are a lot of definitions, a lot of words in this lecture that we're going to be using going forward, so it may be worth going back to the beginning, watching this maybe one or two more times, just to really let some of those words sink in.